Leonard, the concept of black holes is something that common people can talk about today. These very strange regions of very high, if not infinite, density and curvature and uh, residing in the center of uh, many, if not all, galaxies. Uh, to a physicist, and you've studied black holes, why are they so important from a theoretical point of view? Because they lead to a major puzzle they lead to what I would call a conflict of principles. The biggest events in the history of theoretical physics and maybe in physics itself is when principles that you deeply believe clash. Mm. And when principles clash, that's where progress is made. I'll give you an example. Let me give you an example that I like very much and uh, as, uh, as an example of a clash of principles. You know the Greeks had two different theories of the world. One was the theory of the celestial, the planets, the stars, and according to them, the motion of the planets and the stars and everything were governed by perfectly beautiful, elegant laws. Everything moved on perfect circles, crystal spheres, it was lovely, it was beautiful. And then there was the terrestrial, and the terrestrial was ugly. Things fall on the floor, carts get pulled by horses, and if they don't get, continue to get pulled, they grind to a halt. It was corrupt. The terrestrial and the celestial. Two different theories of the world, and they didn't coexist. That persisted until Galileo, and Galileo put an end to that by one simple observation, a thought experiment. The thought experiment was, you take a rock, which is, a, which is terrestrial, an ugly thing, and you throw it far into the air until it goes into orbit around the planet and it becomes celestial. The terrestrial rock became a celestial body. There must be one unified description of both. We're in kind of the same situation. We have two separate theories of nature which are incompatible, apparently, and which need to be put together. One of them is the theory of the very, very small, quantum mechanics. The quantum mechanics of atoms, molecules, and so forth, the uncertainty principle, all these marvelous things that were discovered at the beginning of the 20th century about microscopic physics. At the same time, physicists, Einstein, the same guy, incidentally, was also thinking about the very big and the very heavy. He was thinking about gravity. Gravity governs the very big and the very heavy. Quantum mechanics governs the very small. Two different domains of parameters, two different regimes of the world, just like the Greeks had, okay? Well, some people have the view that there's no need to put them together. There's no need to put them together. One governs the very big and the very heavy, other, it's very small. Why bother looking for a theory which combines them both? They're two different domains to the world. Then you have black holes. <laughs> <laughs> then you have black holes. Black holes are Galileo's rock that he threw into the air, which went, which, which belonged to both regimes. Mm. Black holes are objects which belong to both regimes. They're big and they're heavy, but they have quantum properties. In fact, they're very quantum mechanical objects. Uh, the fact that they belong to both domains tells us we have no choice. We have to put these two theories together. We have to make sense out of them, even though they appear to conflict with each other. We have no choice because black holes are the entry, and just like Galileo's rock, black holes are the entry into the world that combines them both. Okay. That, to me, is why they're so important. Okay, so give me a quick definition of black holes from a physics point of view, and then let's see what some of the issues are when you try to combine their quantum mechanics and their general relativity. Yeah. Um, okay, I can, of course, just tell you the obvious. Black holes are the most dense, concentrated objects that you can make. When a star dies, it just collapses into a black hole. But let me give you a picture of a black hole, which I think is more helpful in understanding what's going on. It's my favorite picture, and prob I probably like it so much because of my former existence as a plumber. <laughs> Imagine an infinite big flat lake. 
It's not very deep. It's only a foot or two deep. It's infinite. It goes on in every direction for, uh, forever and ever. And, of co- and there's creatures living in this lake. I call them polywogs. And they swim around and they communicate. They can't see. All they can do, they're blind. All they can do is hear. And they communicate with each other. They see, quote each other by sound and so forth. And the lake just sits there. A perfectly nice, healthy environment for them. But right at the center of the lake, there's a drain pipe. And the drain pipe empties out below onto some very sharp and deadly rocks. Okay? The water flows into the drain pipe. Very, very far away, the water moves slowly. As you get closer and closer to the drain pipe, it moves faster and faster. And now imagine that the water is being sucked out so fast that at some point around this drain pipe, the velocity of the water gets to exceed the speed of sound. Now remember, these guys can only communicate uh-huh. by sound. They can't right. swim faster than sound. Right. Right? So there's some place which is some circle around the drain pipe which is a point of, of, uh, no, of return. no return. A point of no return. Once they pass that point, not only can't they swim out, but they can't even communicate out. Sound can't get out. They can't get out. They're isolated. And what's more, because the speed of the water exceeds the speed at which they can swim, they're doomed. They're going to crash on those rocks below. That's the end. But just think about one of these uh, polywogs floating on its back down the, uh, down, the, uh, down the drain. When it passes the point of no return, it doesn't. There's nothing special there. There's no signpost there. There's no um, crunch that happens to it. Unknowingly, it just drifts past the point of no return, and it's doomed. Okay? The rocks at the bottom are the analog of the singularity. It's the place where if you fall in, you get killed. That's the center of the black That's hole. That's the center of the black hole. The horizon is the point of no return. You can't see anything inside, or here in this case, You can't hear anything from the inside if you're outside because sound just can't make it out. And in a black hole, the analogy is light. Is of course, light. Is of course, light. That's the nature of a black hole horizon. It's a point of no return. But it was always thought of as a place where if you drifted, meaning fall, drift now means fall, if you just fell through the horizon, you would experience nothing special Mm. from the point of view of somebody falling. On the other hand, from the point of view of somebody outside, it's a barrier that nothing ever passes through. Why do I say that nothing ever passes through it? Imagine watching the polywog fall through or listening to the polywog fall through. Remember, you can never get a sound from inside. The sounds that you hear as the polywog gets closer and closer to the point of no return take longer and longer to get out because they're fighting against the flow. Mm -hmm. And so you will only hear that polywog passing the point of no return after an infinite amount of time. (laughs) So from your point of view, they never fall through. Looks like it's frozen. Looks like it's frozen. So there's this tension, this tension between what is seen from the outside, nothing ever falls through the horizon of a black hole, on the other hand, somebody falling freely through the black hole sees no point, uh, no, uh, no signpost, no anything. And there's a tension, a kind of conflict. It's not a, it's, it's not a mathematical conflict. It's just something funny going on where we have two different descriptions, one from outside the black hole and one from falling through. Now, this got to be a real genuine puzzle when Stephen Hawking and Jacob Beckenstein Uh, realized that black holes have thermal properties, that they have the property of being warm, that they glow, that they give off radiation. And so not only do things fall into black holes, but black holes glow, give off radiation, give off energy, and in the process of giving off energy, they evaporate. Takes a long, long, long time. Yeah, but we don't worry about that. That's right. It takes a very long time. But the theoretical physicists have all the time in the world. We can talk about 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10th years. 
And in time, that black hole will disappear. And it's through a quantum mechanical effect. Through a quantum mechanical effect. Through a quantum, that's right, it's through a quantum mechanical effect. So you see coming together quantum mechanics with the theory of the very heavy, right. namely gravity. Right. Uh, so after a long, long period of time, everything that fell into the black hole has disappeared. The black hole has disappeared. Nothing is left of it. On the other hand, there's this radiation going out, carrying off the energy of the black hole. Why is this puzzling? It's puzzling because it looks like all the information that fell into the black hole disappeared out of our universe. And it's a very, very basic principle of physics that information is not allowed to be lost. What do I mean by information? I mean by information the distinction between things. Uh, you throw into the black hole a chicken or you throw into the black hole a duck. There's information in the question of whether it's a chicken or a duck. The chicken and the duck fall into the black hole. The black hole eventually disappears. That information is just lost from the world. That's a no-no in <laughs> physics, a real no-no. Information is not allowed to be lost. It may get scrambled. It may get mixed up. It may get hard to discern. But the difference between a duck and a chicken is forever. <laughs> now, even if you chop it up and make chopped liver out of it, in principle, you can still recover whether it was chicken or duck. Black holes seem to violate that. So they seem to violate some very, very, very basic principle of physics, which I can call a conservation of information. That was Hawking's view. Things fall into the black hole. It evaporates. Those things and all the information they carried are gone from the universe. That conflicted with 300 years of physics, which said that information must never be lost. So you can see that what was coming together was a clash of principles, a meeting of the realms of the very heavy with the realms of quantum mechanics, and we're now in the position where we have to reconcile this. We have no choice. Oh, of course we have a choice. We can just go and um, do something else. But uh, curiosity keeps pushing you in the direction of trying to reconcile these things. So there is a basic paradox and a conflict in, our, in the principles of physics that we don't understand at the moment. And that conflict is the laws of quantum mechanics, the laws of information, the laws of physics as we've known them for 300 years, says nothing must ever be lost. And that must say that it cannot pass through the horizon, but must be radiated back out. Everything that you throw into a black hole. On the other hand, everything we know about black holes says that things fall into the black hole and are destroyed at the singularity. That is the big conflict that physics is trying to deal with and is trying to reconcile. The answer, whether things fall into black holes and are destroyed, or whether before they actually get to the horizon, they're kicked back out and radiated back out, seems to have the answer that both are true. I will leave you with that. <laughs>